Okay, I've planted seeds and then pulled up my seedlings because I could not tell the difference between weeds and my plants. Is there a way to prevent this from happening? Practice. Yes. <laughs> so I kind of mentioned that earlier when we were talking about the seeding here, sorry. When you start your seeds, use growing media or soilless mixes for that because that's basically a mix of peat moss, some wood chips that are processed very fine. They will have a little bit of perlite in there, which is a volcano stone that has been processed to a manufactured stone. And it's similar to charcoal, so you can absorb water and nutrients and then give them up. So if you use something like this, it doesn't come with any weed seeds. Now, if you plant your seeds, then the only thing that can grow is what you planted. Now, in the garden, um, it can be a bit more challenging, but even there, for the beginning, if you are having a little bit of a hard time knowing what is what, you could put a little layer of this soil mix in your garden in a small spot, plant some of your seeds in there, and plant the rest in a normal soil, and then you will see what's supposed to come out, and then you can match these plants and find, okay, this should stay there and this should come out. Another, another good thing is, um there's one method of planting that's become popular, and that's square foot gardening, where you're mixing a lot of plants. Mm -hmm. That makes it really difficult, especially for people who aren't used to spotting something and knowing right away what that plant looks like. So keeping things in rows. If we'll you help. see your weeds perfectly spaced in rows, then they're not weeds. <laughs> that's your plants. Yeah. Right. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you all here, and a nice welcome to everyone online as well. So today, I'm going to talk about seeds and planting seeds. And I think this is one of the most awesome things that we're doing when we're gardening and growing food. Um, first up here, I'll just show you a quick view of a book that we're selling here that will help you a lot about like to understand how seeds work, what families of plants are there, how you can save seeds and how you can get different seeds to change a little bit in what they um, look like or what they grow like. So I'm going to put this here. You can get it in our store here when the store is open and it's a very, very handy book to have. Um, the book is called, very simple, it's called Seed to Seed. You can also get it online from us. So if you're interested, that can be some really good help. So first of all today, I want to go back to where all the seeds started and came from. And maybe you guys can help me to figure that out. Does anyone remember where the first garden was planted, where the first seeds were created, where that all comes from? I'm opening it up to you guys. Tell me. Anyone knows? Garden of Eden. All right. That's very simple, and that's true. So God created all the plants for us for a reason, and the Bible says very clearly that they are producing seed, not only to reproduce, but also to feed us. And that is very nice, because God even thought of what we should eat, and he even lets that grow for us. And a lot of things grow wild for us. We don't even have to do anything about them. But there's a lot of things that we can grow in our garden, things that we can even store over the winter, that we can eat and get strength and energy from. So today, I want to start off by talking a little bit about different types of seeds and how you should choose your seeds, what you can use as guidelines to choose your seeds, and also a little bit of what the seeds need in order to germinate. That's the part when the seed first breaks open and starts sprouting. And that's a very important part in the growing of plants. So, for example, here I have a couple beans. You all know what beans look like. I'm going to show you just a couple other seeds here. Um, we have some really fine seeds here. 
you might not be able to see them very well. They're really small seeds. Those are carrot seeds, for example. Then I'll just put some more here. This is actually lettuce seeds. And this package got pretty worked already because we use it a lot. Right here is lettuce seeds. And there's probably 200 right there. Um, I'll bring some out from the spinach. Spinach seeds are a bit bigger. And they have a couple sharp edges sometimes. Sometimes they're a bit more round. Some spinach. And then there's also some much, much bigger ones that I'm going to put here for now. So these are squash seeds, butternut squash. First of all, you need to decide what do I want to grow in my garden, right? Because you don't want to grow stuff that you're not going to eat or that might not grow in your location. So choose what will grow in my location. And here we're speaking about the geographic location, like your climate, your growing season, how long that is, the temperature range you're working with, and that kind of thing. Once you settle that question, and there's a lot of um, guidelines with all the different seed companies that will sell you seed. If you go on their websites or you get their seed catalog, it'll tell you a lot about which varieties are better for the north, for the south, which varieties are better for heat or for cooler weather. So you kind of choose, first of all, where am I and where am I going to grow my garden and what can grow there? Because it might be hard here to grow bananas and pineapples and then if you're somewhere far in the south, there might be some fruits that like it cooler that might not grow well there. So, you know, you kind of figure that out first. Next up, you want to choose varieties that um, will for sure mature in the growing season you have. And so there is varieties that will, for example, let's say, take 110 days from when they germinate until you will get your fruit. And 110 days sounds a lot, but it's only just over three months. But if your growing season is only 90 days from the last frost until the first frost in the fall, then there's a good chance that you're set up for failure. Your crop might not make it and mature before you can harvest it. So you want to kind of figure out when is my last frost in the spring? And you can, again, talk to people that live in this area for a long time or go online. There's some really good info out there on different weather websites on what your frost dates look like. Now, there is plants, for example, kale, that can grow into the fall. And even if a little bit of frost hits, it won't damage it. So that's OK. So you have some more time. But then, for example, if you grow zucchini or you grow squash, or you grow some of the other plants that need a lot of temperature, warm heat. If the hard frost hits, those are done. There's no more fruit coming off them, no more flowers, nothing. So you kind of want to work within the range you have. And there's places where you might not get any frost, which is probably not in Canada. <laughs> but um, those places will give you a variety of times when you can plant stuff. So then once we settle that, now we can go and decide if we would like to use certified organic seed, or if we just use commercial seed, just straight, whatever it comes off. Or you can get seed that's treated. And treated seed is always something you want to be careful with a little bit. Sometimes the treatments are pretty harmless, and they just help it to germinate better, or the treatment will help that the crows don't eat it, or that kind of thing. But some of the treatments can actually have some pretty bad stuff in them that you probably wouldn't want to bring into your garden like even some almost to the level of drugs almost that they add. So if you use treated seed, you want to make sure you educate yourself of what the treatment is made out of and then decide if you want to move forward with that or not. I personally prefer untreated seed as much as possible. Um, but there is times like for corn, if you plant corn and you didn't cover it properly and the crows get hungry and they figure that out, they might eat a lot of your corn. So they do treat it in the big farms. It's all treated seed. And that treatment is actually harmful to bees if they get it through water that's on the plants in the morning. So there's always a little bit of a give and take. And you want to consider that. Because if you buy treated seed and then there's all this poison on there that's even harming your skin as you touch the seed, well, maybe not a good idea, right? And then the next thing that I really um, like to think of is, when will I need the seeds by? Because 
if you order tomato seeds in April and you're supposed to plant them March 1, that's going to be a challenge, right? So it's a good idea to make a little plan and say, okay, what things am I going to plant this year? And when will I need those seeds by? And just a little suggestion, give yourself a couple weeks. Have those seeds arrive in December or January if you can, so that when you need them, they're actually here. Because if you plant them too late, you might be dealing with trouble all the way to harvest because everything is pushed out. Now some crops, like spinach, you seed it, it'll grow very quickly, and even if you run out of seed, you order some more and it's here next week and you plant it, it's not gonna be a big deal. But some things that take a long time, you wanna have that seed on time. Another thing that's important is when you receive the seed, you wanna store it very cool, dark, and dry. And I think the, the temperature and the moisture are probably the biggest things. But all of these three are very important. You do not want to store them in the sun. You do not want to store them in very warm temperatures. And you want them nice and cool and dark and no moisture. Because moisture, if it's cold and dark, moisture can make a mold or rot. If it's warm, they might start sprouting. But then if there's not enough moisture, they might stop sprouting. And then when you plant them, they might be like, oh, I don't have energy anymore. I'm just not going to sprout, right? So keeping them cool, dark, and dry is very important until you plant them. And even if there's seed left over, once you're done seeding, put that back in a cool, dark place where it's dry so that your seed stays good. Seed, depending on the variety or on the type of plant, can store for many, many years. Some of the grains can store even for hundreds of years if they're stored properly. If your seed is not stored properly, it may not make it to the second year. Like if you buy it this spring and you seed some and you keep some and you store it really in bad conditions, you might not get much germination or any germination at all next year. So you want to keep that storage in mind. Um, the weeds also have seeds and they store really well, just to throw that in there. There is some weed seeds that can actually survive 40 years in the soil without growing. And when you disturb the soil and you bring those up to where their conditions are right, they will grow. And that's something to maybe to keep in mind just as we're talking about the seeds. The weed seeds stay in there. So if you can keep your garden clean and never allow the weeds to throw much seeds, then you can slowly empty that bank account of seeds in the ground a little bit. But if you let a plant go to seed that you don't want there, you'll be dealing with it for a while because all these seeds won't germinate the next year. They will stay there and wait for their time. Okay, so now we have the seeds at home. We have a plan when we need to plant them and we have kind of laid out what time frame we're gonna get them into the soil and now we need to decide what their needs are. So there are some seeds, I'm just gonna show you a tray right here. This is, okay, anyone knows what this could be? Just for the fun of it. Don't read the tag. <laughs> okay, this is arugula. And I planted it August 4, so just about two weeks ago. And it's growing very nicely and it has its true leaves already, which I'll explain just a little bit later here. And it's very thick here. That would be something you can use to cut for greens, to use fresh. But if you wanted these plants to mature big, this would be way too close. Now, I'm gonna show you just another tray here real quick to get started. Anyone knows what this could be? I know these are still small, so it might not be easy. This is romaine lettuce. And we made two nice mistakes here on purpose to show you a little bit what can happen. So once we come to the seeding, um, we just need to separate the seeds that need to be planted directly in the ground because it will be better for them. And then put the seeds aside that need to be planted in pots or trays and start it ahead of time. So for example, if you want tomatoes, and you start the seed early in the spring, and I'm talking like end of February, March, maybe April, then you'll start them in a greenhouse or in a warm spot in your house where you have lots of light, 
and you will raise them, you will transplant them, you get them to a decent size, they may have the first flowers, and then you plant them outside or in your greenhouse, depending on your conditions. If you planted tomato seeds in end of May, there's a pretty good chance that you will not get any fruit that year. And so it's very important to know the time frame. If you're too early, that can be a struggle. If you're too late, you might be pushing it too. So once we sorted out which seeds need to be planted when, now we can decide um, what containers or trays we would like to put them in. Here I just have normal trays that we use, that the horticulture uses. There's different styles, some a bit more sturdy than others, but you basically want to have a clean, soft, flat seed bed. And I'm just going to put this back here for a second. And now we're going to show that a little bit, how that could look. So I'm just going to use this tray so that this nice table doesn't get full with dirt and soil here. So now we're going to fill this tray. Let me try to keep this clean here. Actually, let's do it this way. Come again? Yes, good point. So I prefer to use potting mix for that. And the main reason for that is it has good drainage. It's very soft. It can contain moisture, and the trays are fairly light even when you water them. Now, you can start it in normal soil from your garden, but then those trays will be really heavy. You will also be growing weeds as you go because the weed seeds are in there. And also, if you have rocks in there and other stuff, it might be a little bit hard for you to get good coverage around all the seeds. So if you go to any horticulture supply store, feed store, even the grocery stores in the spring, they will sell potting soil. And generally speaking, seeds don't need a lot of nutrients when they first germinate. Their time is to absorb lots of water, to pop open, to get the first root down, to get the first leaves up, and to start growing. At that time, they don't need much nutrients. So most of the soilless mixes that are used in horticulture they have just about no nutrients in them, and that's okay. But once they grow up, then you have to bring something in or else they'll get pretty hungry. So let's fill this tray here. We'll just put a little bit more in here. One thing that's very important when you're seeding seeds is that your soil is very fine because the way how seeds germinate is they need to get lots of moisture into themselves and they need to be well covered all around themselves. Um, so by having fine soil, when you plant the seed and you pack it down, your seed is actually covered all around with soil. And then that helps to make the connection when you water it that all the moisture in the soil gets soaked into the seed. So here we'll just put a little bit more. That's probably good. And then I like to use a little board, sometimes it's just scrap wood, and you can kind of go over your tray, and you can, I'll hold this up a little bit, just level this out here. And then you can also use a piece of plywood or a piece of plexiglass or something, and just press down the soil so that you have a very smooth, clean seed bed. I don't know if you guys can see that. So now you can figure out what the needs of that plant are. Some things you want to space out more because they might be in here for a couple weeks and then you'll transplant them. Um, some things, you can even start seeds early, like this arugula, let it grow like that and then cut it. You don't even have to grow it outside yet if it's still too cold. So depending on what you want to do with it, you need to decide your spacing. Oftentimes I just like to use my fingers, make a couple rows in here that are just a little dip, and then we're going to plant stuff in there and then lightly cover it. And when we talk about covering, there is different types of seeds that need different things. One thing that all the seeds need is they need a certain amount of temperature, moisture, and light. And when it comes to the light, there is something very interesting. I, th I think it's awesome. There are seeds that actually require light to germinate. And just to give you an example, 
um, celery, um, chamomile, even lettuce, and most of your herbs that have very small seed require light. Now what does that mean? They require the short wavelengths of light that come from the sun to help them get started and germinate. And for most of them, it's best if you can plant them without covering them, and if you cover them, cover them very lightly so that that fine, short light wave can still penetrate it. If you plant them too deep, what that means for them is, this is not my year, and then they might not grow, or they might grow only way later than expected. So it's a good practice to check, hey, are these seeds needing light to germinate or not? Now, I will add something to this. Most seeds need light, but they don't need the light that you think of when you see it on your hand. They need some of the longer waves that come through the light, and they actually penetrate the ground a bit. So when you plant them this deep, they will still get that extra little bit of heat and light penetrating there, and that will wake them up and start them growing. So it's important to know that if they need lots of light to germinate and you bury them, nothing will grow, I can guarantee you. And I have actually tried it. I planted chamomile and covered it really well. And for weeks, there was nothing growing. And then what I did is I prepared a tray like that. And then I used a spray bottle, or you can also use a fine nozzle. And I sprayed that soil really well. So it's nice and soaked and really, really smooth. And then I would use the chamomile seed, and I would seed it really fine on there and then let it soak a little bit, and then spray it some more, and then that was it. But we all know that when you plant seeds, they need to be moist throughout the whole germination process. They don't have a root yet to get water deep down. So one thing that I found that could be really helpful is one of these hats. So you need to moist, get lots of moisture in there, soak it pretty well, seed the seed, and then just spray it so the seed doesn't get washed away. If you wash it into one corner, you <laughs> have a lot of plants in that corner. So it's something you need to be very careful with. Then you can put this hood on, and there's two little um, switches that you can turn around, and now you can control the moisture in there. This will really help to keep the moisture in, and that'll help your seeds to grow. If you don't have that, you'll have to spray it every hour maybe in the day to keep those seeds moist. And if they dry out, they'll stop germinating, so you need to keep them moist. So that's one thing that can help with the plants that need light for germination. Um, we have another option here, and this is a dibble board. That's what it's called. You can make those yourself, or you can buy them, and then you can push them into the soil, and they will make all the little holes for you, and now you just plant your seed right in these holes. You don't have to make all these holes. Now, you can take a little stick, you can take the back of a Sharpie pen, whatever, and make your holes that way. But with this, you get even spacing, you can choose how deep you want to go, and then you just fill all the holes, right? So that can be another helpful thing. So once we plant them, we'll just, we'll just take some of the beans here, very simple. Um, we can plant them in here, and we'll give them enough space so when we transplant them, we won't rip the plants apart from each other. And that's something that brings me back to, to this tray. If you, guys, um, if you guys look at this lettuce here, we seed it a ton in here, like a ton. If you try to take these out, and I'm just gonna do that right now, you see how many plants I have here? Most of the roots got damaged in the process of pulling them out. And now if you separate them, they're gonna have a really hard time growing and they have really long stems already and a lot of them will die. So it is worth it that when you're planting your seeds the first time into the soil, that you space them out so that when you transplant them, there's enough space to take them apart from other plants without damaging them. Usually, when you're transplanting, it is okay that you destroy or rip or break some of the roots, as long as you're not breaking it right between the root and the plant, right? So if there was a lot of roots and some of them got chopped or clipped off, that's okay, that will actually stimulate the plant and say, hey, you gotta make more roots. But you don't wanna have this scenario 
where now the plant has no more roots and it will die, right? So if you plant any root crops in these trays early in the spring, which is not something you need to do a whole lot, but you can, let's say you plant red beets, um, those you want to be very careful because disturbing the root means disturbing the way how the root will turn out later. And that can make not very nice red beets later. But if you're talking any crops that are going to be above ground, it's okay to even chop some of the roots back a little bit to stimulate them to grow more. So lesson from that, take your time to space out the seeds when you plant them. This is the easiest time to space them out. Once they're like this, it's going to be crazy and you will lose a lot of plants just trying to separate them. Okay. So then there are some other plants that you would just take from a pot and plant them straight in the ground. For example, here we have butternut squash plants. I showed you the seeds here earlier. That's what they look like. We just plant two in here or four in here, whatever. Let them grow up when they're big enough. Plant them right out in the field. Those you can plant in trays, but they need a little bit more soil. And it might be handy to have them like this so you can plant them right into the ground. Um, here's another thing that I really like. This is basil. It smells very good. This is also just about two weeks old now. And we plant it a lot in here so that it fills it up nice. But basil, you can space apart. You can take three, four plants and plant them in different spots and they will all grow up really nice. So some plants are a bit more picky with separating them than others. And depending what the plant will be when it's big, a tomato plant, you want only one at a time so they don't interfere with each other. Basil, it's okay to have three or four together. They'll be happy. They'll just grow nice leaves and grow. Okay, so one thing that I forgot to mention in the beginning that I want to mention now is there is also pelleted seed. Now, it's something that you're probably not going to use a lot in your garden when you just start, but if you want to do bigger quantities, it can really help. And I'll just bring some out here real quick. Maybe you can see that. Pelleted seed helps you to singulate them, to separate them when you're planting them. So what they do is they have a machine that will take one seed and they'll put a layer of clay around it and then they'll roll it and dry it. Now your seed is perfectly round. It's covered in air. You can use now seeding machines or even if you do it by hand, it's a lot easier to pick these little seeds in little round clay balls and you just put them in there. So that's another thing that you can do that can really help you when you have fine seed to singulate it out. Okay, I mentioned it a little bit earlier already, but once you start your seeds, once they get wet, you want to keep them wet. And you want to keep them consistently wet until they have come out of the ground. If you let them dry out once, it will set them back. You might not see it right then, but in that process, they're so fragile and so little and so weak. If they get a drought right there, just for a day, that can really set them back. And some seeds will germinate sooner than others. So if the drought hits them in the wrong spot, they might just decide, oh, this is not a good condition for me here. This is not a good environment. I'm not going to grow this year. I'm going to wait for more rain next year. So it's very important to keep them moist. Now, I will make a disclaimer there. Do not flood them and keep them in standing water because that will kill them. They also need oxygen and they need a little bit of fresh air every day and you don't want that to be like soaked and just sitting in water. Now, some seeds, you can soak them for the first couple hours before you plant them, soak them in some water and then plant them. That can give them a head start. But with the smaller seeds, it gets really difficult because they all stick together. So I would only do that like with beans or squash or some of the smaller ones that you can still pick easy. You could soak them first and then plant them. But once you plant them, you just want to keep it moist. Don't let it dry out until they grow. Okay? So that's that. Um, let me see what else I was going to show. Oh, yes. Does someone know how the seeds of a potato plant look like? It's potato? Are you sure? I'm not so sure about that. Okay, so I have some potatoes here that have been 
in special conditions to show you guys what they can look like before we plant them. Now, I'd suggest it's a bit too late to plant them now, but we still have some of these. So here you have potatoes. These are not seeds. These are parts of the storage system that the plant use by the roots to start growing next year again. And basically what happens is these will have the same genetic information as the first plant that actually produced them. And so potatoes are not seeds. However, they can, in the right conditions, grow flowers and then grow seeds. But to grow a potato from that will take you a while. It will not just be a few weeks. So that's another thing. Some things don't grow from seed or it's not worth it to grow them from seed because it takes a long time. And you can try it. It's fun. But for example, potatoes, you can plant them in the ground in the spring. They'll grow, they'll multiply, and you harvest them again. You store some for next year, and you can plant them back in again. It's the same with garlic or other plants that will have some type of root storage bulb or other way of storing their energy for next year, and then they'll grow again. So you don't only always need seeds. You might also need some seed potatoes, which are not seeds. They're just called that way because that's what we do. And I have some here that are yellow potatoes, and you can see there are um, even little potatoes on here already. They're trying to survive for next year. And then I also have some red ones here, and they're also trying to survive as well here. Um, maybe something to talk about is to grow your own seeds. And when you grow your own seeds, there's a few things to keep in mind. One is that growing your own seeds means it takes a lot of care and you need as much time as possible so they can mature before the winter comes. Growing your own seeds also involves a couple other things. You want to start with good seed and you want to start with true seed that's heirloom or open pollinated because like we talked about earlier, hybrid seed will not bring you the same type of crop quite next year. You will have a lot of different types of things coming out there, different taste, different shape, different color, and it won't really reproduce what you planted in the first year. Another thing is when you grow your own seeds, there is a lot of things that can impact that reproduction system. So if you have bad weather, if you get mold on there, if the birds come, you want to factor these things in um, because that can really set you back if you're fully counting on that. Another thing that I find is really awesome about growing your own seed is that God created the seeds in a way where if you plant one seed, in most cases you'll get hundreds of seeds from that seed. And I think that's awesome because there's enough to replant, there's enough to even eat them, and there's enough to even have some be lost to the animals that come, or even if something gets sick and you have several plants, there's always a chance of survival. It's not just plant one seed, get two, you get like plant one and you get 100, 200, 300. Um, when you harvest your seeds, you want to make sure they mature. They're dried up and they have matured well. Otherwise, if they're still green and you harvest them and you try to plant them next year, they may not grow for you because they're not fully matured. And the drying process is also very important. If they're not dried properly and they start molding, that can break them down and basically make them useless. When you buy seeds, sometimes it will say on your package that those seeds are protected by certain rights or they're protected that only someone can reproduce them. They're not allowed to just everyone take them and grow new seeds from it. So if you're trying to get into the seed business or growing all your own seed, you want to just consider that too, that some seeds varieties are protected and there's rights on them. And if you're caught growing them again, it might not be a good thing. In most cases, if you only grow two for your garden, no one is probably going to bother you, but you want to still keep that in mind that that is a thing. Nowadays, it's all about rights and all about the policies and the different, um, this is mine and I have the name and the right for it, right? So you want to consider that too. That's 
probably good for here. I'll show you a few other little crops that I have here. Um, here we have some beans. Those are actually these beans. Um, they're called provider, they're green beans. And as you can see here, some of them have done really well. Some of them are doing okay. And that's another thing, when you grow seeds, there will be different sizes and different kind of quality of seeds. What a lot of seed companies do is, they will size the seed, so they will sort it by size, they will sort it by weight, they will sometimes even sort it by shape, and with that, they can guarantee a better germination rate and more even plants to grow. So if you go to a normal grocery store and you buy the cheapest seed you can get there, oftentimes, and this might sound bad, but it's the truth, oftentimes that's the cast out of what has been sorted out from the good seed. And so now you're planting bad seed, it might still grow, but you're not really getting a good start. So I encourage all of you that if you buy seed, buy good seed, it's worth it. And then you will actually get seed that's sized, that's calibrated, that's sorted, and there's a much higher chance of it growing for you well. Um, a lot of companies will also write on the seed package there. They will write on there how many seeds are in there. Sometimes they're nice and they'll give you a couple extra ones. But there's always um, a chance that not all the seeds will germinate. Sometimes they do testing and they'll tell you, okay, 95% germinated in our test in January, so you can expect something similar in March. So you want to look at that when you buy seeds. If the germination rate is low, then that means you might have to seed more to still get the plants that you're looking for, and or you might consider not buying that seed because it's going to be very uneven. There might be more plants in some spot and then nothing for a while. And what happens is when seed gets older, the rate of how many of them will germinate comes down lower. So it's very important, like I said earlier, to store them well because the storing well will help them to all germinate for longer time. Um, there is something that we brought in here for you guys. Anyone know what this could be? This is dill, correct. So we all know what dill looks like when it's small and when we use it for pickling and we use it in the salad and use it to make herb salts, whatever. Here we have a dill plant that has grown out to flower. Then the flower dried up and we have seeds developing here. Now these seeds have been dried out of the sun in a cool place for a while. And now these seeds, if you take them off, which I'll try to do here for you. Now all these seeds come off here. Now you can clean them a little bit and you could um, check if there's any seeds that are where there's nothing in them. That is normal, that happens sometimes. And then you could use these seeds and plant them and your new dill will grow. So some crops will go to flower every year, and you could take seeds there every year if you want, such as dill. And then there's other crops, and this might be going a little bit deeper into growing seeds for yourself, but if you, for example, want to make seed out of carrots, it's not going to happen in the first year. You'll have to harvest the carrot root in the spring, plant it again, then a new plant grows, makes flowers actually similar to what the dill looks like, and then in that fall, they will produce seed and then you can use that in the year after. So some of the seed production might not be something, oh, let's grow some seed. It might actually take some time and that's good to consider as well. Anyone know what this could be? Uh, almost. I have some cucumbers right here. Yes, that's correct. Those are radishes. Now radishes, I just grew them here for you guys so you can see them in here. But um, radishes are something that grows very quickly. And I would suggest that you would always just plant them straight into the ground, plant the seed in there. They'll mature very quickly, especially in the summer. And if you give them enough water, they're just going to be awesome. And they're really healthy. And there's very low problems with like sickness, disease, anything. So you can always mix those in in different crops, plant them when there's nothing growing there, whatever. 
They grow fast, and they're a really good crop to grow. All right. Now, we planted our seeds in our tray or our pots or whatever we're going to plant them in. Now, we want to make sure that we know what we planted in there. And this is probably one of the finishing touches on seeding that tray. We want to mark it in some way or another so that we know what's growing in there. Because some seeds might take up to three weeks to germinate. And if you move these trays around, suddenly you don't know anymore what's in there. And you're like, man, what was this? I'm growing 10 different varieties of tomatoes and I don't remember which one this was, right? So what I like to do is I like to write the date on the top of the tag and just write it on the top there. And then you know, okay, I seeded them August 18. Then you write on there what type of crop is. So I'll write on here, for example, right now, we'll say green beans. So on the first check, when you look, oh, it says green beans. And then on the back, I like to write the variety and any other important information that I want to keep along with this tray. So that could tell me, oh, this is a hybrid or this is a non-hybrid. That could tell me, oh, this was the seed from that company or from this company. And just put some of that information on there as well. So now when you go through your growing area, you're like, oh, these are the green beans from that company. They're doing well. And then, oh, these green beans are not doing well. I wonder what's wrong there, right? So it's very important to mark them so that you know what's, what's going on there. And then I just stick them in there. If you do several varieties in a tray, you can make two to mark one variety, put two more, and kind of section that off even. One thing that can be real disappointing is if you use a pen that's not a permanent marker. Because you'll water these every day, the sun is shining on them, it's hot, and before you know it, all the writing comes off, and then comes May, you're sitting there in your garden, you're like, hmm, there's a tag in there, but I don't remember what this was, and it doesn't say anything on it. So make sure you use something, either permanent marker or pencil, something that will not come off by the sun and the water, okay? That is that. And then sometimes, if you do a lot more, I like to also write it down in a little book. Just write down all the things I seeded that week, this week and on, so I can go back. If I lost one of these or there's only one left, then I know what's going on and I can track it back a little bit. That is that for the seeding part, I believe. Um, let me get some water here. Now I would like to show you some of the tools that we can use in our garden and we'll start with the seeders because that can be really handy if you're direct seeding crops into your garden or your field. So I'm going to have Mackenzie come here and help me out, and then we'll show you some of the cedars we have here today. All right. Okay, so this is a push cedar. It runs without electricity. It runs without any sort of mechanical source of energy, it's literally you pushing it. You hold it with your hands and you just walk right behind it like a little stroller. The push cedar, called earthway cedar, can be very, very helpful in your garden. And it's very simple, there's not much that can break, and as long as you prepare your soil very nicely ahead of time, and what I mean by that is a soft layer of soil that has no big rocks in them, it's just nice and clean, no weeds, and that's soft to push it through, then you can use the earthway cedar to plant a variety of things. Now, the way how it works is, you put your seed up here, and just my suggestion, don't fill it up full, only fill it half full so that the seeds don't spill out when you're working. And you can hold the belt here, and then you turn the disc inside there, so there is a seed disc that goes right in here on that little pulley and it just hooks in with three little hooks. 
And the way how the seed disk works is, as you're pushing it, yeah, as you're pushing it, that wheel turns. So it picks up seed from the bottom of that hopper and it carries it up. And then on the top here, I'll turn this around now. So the seed gets picked up down here, it gets carried up. And then there's a hole that leads into this channel. So the seed now gets pushed into the channel and it falls down and it falls all the way down here. Now here we have a little plow that you can adjust in height and if you put it down into the soil, depending on how deep you want your seeds planted, you can now, when you push it, you make a little furrow. That plow is open in the middle. So now the seeds fall in there and then you have a little chain here and that chain just very slightly drags over that furrow where the seeds are laying. So now the seeds get covered and then this little wheel presses it on. So now the seeds are perfectly packed into the soil. And that machine has saved me a lot of time this year already. Um, when I planted corn, peas, beans, you can even plant radishes, red beets, all these different crops that are direct seeded can be really time saving if you use this. I've planted beans in my garden and I would suggest that it would take me a whole day to plant them by hand, going there with a little bag and planting one by one. And with this, it took me about an hour and a half, which is a huge time saver. Um, for very small seeds, I would suggest that if this is the budget you have and you want to start with this, it will work okay. But when you need high precision, I think that it's maybe not the best option for you because it's not as precise with small seeds. And just to show you a little bit, there's a lot of different seed discs. So each hole will pick up one or two seeds depending on the crop. So we have, we have one here, what it says, for beets, Swiss chard. We have a lot of different discs. And then some of them, this is for popcorn, it gives you more spacing because the corn needs to be further apart. And this is for leeks or radishes or things that size. They even made a disc for planting cucumbers, which is awesome. <laughs> I haven't really straight planted cucumbers into the ground, but I guess you can do it. Um, so these discs are interchangeable literally in two seconds. And that seeder with some extra discs here will be somewhere in the neighborhood of 200 to $300, which is actually not bad. And you can order that online. There's a lot of different companies that will supply that. They'll ship it to your house, a little bit of assembling work, and, and you're good to go. So if you want to grow more or enough to feed your family, to have some extra to give to your neighbors, that can really save you a lot of time. Now here, we have um, a seeder called the Jang Seeder. And I would say that's a little bit a step up from the Earthway. However, in the trials that I have done this year, I found that with bigger beans and corn, it wasn't doing as good as this little Earthway seeder. But all the fine stuff, like all the carrots I seeded on the field out there, I seeded with this. All the spinach, all these fine different things works really well. So the way how this works is you have a lid up here. It's got a bunch of little... Um, imprints that show you different sizes. So you can size your seeds and then that will tell you a number that you can use to help find the right seed roller. So this is your hopper, you have a little white screw here. And if you open it up, you can then open the seed hopper. And here's the seed roller, I don't know if you guys can see that. And so the way how it works is, it sits like that, the seed is in here, and now I'll show it this way. Now, as the roller turns, it picks up seeds. And then there's a little brush here that will hold back the seeds that are too much, that it don't fit into the hole. And then as they fall down here, they have to get past this little, little velvet, I guess. And so they go past that, and then they fall down this hopper and they fall down into a channel 
that looks the same as the earthway cedar. They both have a little plow, make a furrow, seed falls in there. And on this one, there's these little guys that push the soil on and then it packs it down. So to change these rollers, it's very simple. You pull this pin out and then there is a little gear. You pull that out and then you get the seed roller out. Now you can buy a lot of different sizes of holes. You can buy some with single rows on them, double rows and different spacing. And that will give you a variety of things that you can plant. Yeah, there's some bigger ones right there. So if you compare these, you can see these are a lot bigger than these. So they will pick up radishes, for example, which these won't. And then there's even bigger ones. And then there is these that are for really big seed. So you can basically fit a small bean or a small corn in here as well. Now, all these can be changed in each of these hoppers, which means you can, you can plant up to five rows at a time. So if you're planting crops like spinach and you want a lot of it because you're cutting it for fresh leaves, for your smoothie or for your salad, then you want a lot of rows seeded so the weeds don't even have time to come between them. But you can also run the seeder and say, hey, I only want two rows or three rows. So you can change your spacing out depending on the crop and depending on the needs of the crop. So you could go like this, or you could even say, I just want one in the middle, and I run it down, and when I come back, I have perfect spacing between the two. So it gives you a lot of variety. Now all the settings are adjustable, so you can go deeper, go higher, you can also move them a little bit. And then the last thing is in here that really helps with the spacing between the first seed, the second seed, the third seed, is a little cover here. So this is the driving chain. So when you push the cedar, these wheels drive that chain. And then they come in here on the shaft and they drive all the seed rollers. And so if you change these gears out, there's like a whole bunch of them mounted right on here. You can change how much space between the seeds will be based on the speed from the wheels compared to the gears. So you can stretch it or get it closer together. And that's actually a fairly quick thing to do. Um, and then you just take it on the ground. Again, it's very important that the soil is not muddy. It needs to be fairly dry, well prepared, nice and smooth, no big rocks. And then you can, maybe we can take it down and just push it for a second in front there maybe. So you can push it like that. If it's in the soil, then the back roller will turn as well. And then it'll just plant the seeds in there right there. So for a lot of crops, like carrots, you want them seeded fine. You want nice rows, but you want them still separated enough so each carrot can size up and mature properly. So that seeder will cost a bit more. I think we're talking more like in the $2,000 and up range. But... But then you can then also... Each of the, yeah, the rollers cost a extra, little bit of money yeah. too. So the more rollers you have, the more expense you're going to have in the, in the cedar. Right. Now, it depends. If you're only doing two meters of carrots in one of your beds in your garden, this is not worth it. Just take the time, sit down, and you know, seed them in there. But if you're thinking of growing enough food that you can feed your family, that you can maybe give to your neighbors, to your friends, to your relatives, maybe even have some excess that you could sell, then a little hand seeder like this can seed a few acres for you if you go to the gym enough before then. <laughs> One other thing I'd like to say about the Jang seeder is that you don't have to get the one that has five of these. That is correct. You can get a single. Yes. So then that runs around $700, I believe, for the single one and it's almost 2,000 for the five. So that saves you quite a bit of money. And then you can just get a select few of the rollers instead of getting all the rollers. If you're gonna use maybe the Earthway for all your bigger things, and then maybe only your beets, your carrots, some of the things that are very particular about spacing. Because one thing that uh, we found out the Earthway works really good, especially for starting. You can get them as cheap as 150 bucks. Um, 
But with carrots or beets, things like that, you're going to have to go and thin them or else they're going to crowd each other and they're not going to grow nice and big. So if you have the jang, it gives the perfect spacing. You don't have to go and do extra work. It just, you just do it once and it's done. Good guy here. Okay, so that's the two cedars that we have used on the farm here this year. And it's been really helpful for me to have those. And we've seeded with that uh, several acres. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Okay, so that's the cedars. What else should we show here today? Maybe, Maybe we, we should could start, start with the hose. Sure. Yeah, okay. So there is a lot of different types of hand tools out there on the market and in a lot of gardens. And all of them have the same purpose. You want to cultivate the ground and you want to get the weeds knocked out as soon as you can, as small as possible. So here we have a new system that we're trying this year and it uses two different types of things. Um, it uses wires, um, just like this, and then it uses also a blade like this. Now there is different widths you can get depending on how far apart your rows are. And this metal blade is sharpened on one side. So when you go into the ground like this, it's sharp, so it actually helps you cut through the ground and it'll help you to undercut the weeds right away. So when you get through there, those weeds have no more roots and then they die. And this is used not when your weeds are already a foot high. Yes, that's This a good is point. when they're as small as the little seedlings on yes. the start of the tray so there. So when we look at weeds, we want to make sure that no later than when they have the first true leaf, which is the first leaf that looks like a lettuce, for example, in this case, you want to get those right down here. Get them when the roots are still so soft that if you press them, they're just squished and done. Um, the sooner you can get the weeds, the easier it will be. And out on the field, we have used those type of hoes this year, and we have caught the weeds in this stage or smaller. And we had to go through, when it got hot, we had to go through it every week, three weeks in a row, and then the weed pressure slowed down quite a bit. So catching them first thing as soon as you can really helps you to stay up on top of this. Once your weeds are tall, these tools will, will pretty much not be effective at all because the weeds are so big and the roots are so strong, you won't be able to cut it. Um, just one more thing on this. This system is very nice because you can just pull this back. Normally they're very fast. Yeah, they're easy to switch. <laughs> Maybe I have to just be like this. Here we go. So this is the end just like on an impact driver or, or power drill. And when you pull that red sleeve back, um, you just push that in there and it clicks. And now you can use it. And so this system actually suggests that you have one of these guys, carabiner, hook it up to your belt. And then you just switch. There's, right now I have three different widths here. These are actually the same. Um, so depending on how wide your crops are apart, you can pull through and the wire will do the same as the hoe, except the wire works better in sandy soil. It's really soft and it really needs to be used when the weeds are small. If they're big, they'll all catch around here and pile up and then it's not as effective anymore. The wires you can even use even before you really see the weeds. Right. Because they're already growing under the surface. So if you just take that and run down your row, you're catching them before they're even coming out. And if you don't, then you might have to resort to something like that. Yes. So this one is a little bit of a stronger type of tool, I guess. And the way how it's used is you cut through the ground like this and you can also push it through if you need to. And it's, you can get bigger weeds a little bit better, but like I said, if you can get them in a small stage, you're ahead of the game. So this can be used also on the walkways if the weeds are like walked down and they're a bit harder and stuff, you just slice that off and they can be really handy to use in your garden as well. Okay, so maybe we should show the standard. OK, 
Here's just a standard hoe that you can buy in most of the stores. They are used like this. So you go into the ground and you scrape it off. Um, if you have big weeds, this is probably the strongest when it comes to like hoeing them out. Um, but if the soil is really dry, even that might have a hard time getting into the soil. What I have found is this year with different trials in the field there, when we had bigger weeds, if we hold with this, you have to be very careful that you don't miss any spot because what happens is you pick up a bunch of soil, you pull it back, and now you think this is all weeded, but some weeds never got touched. And then you pick up some more and throw dirt on those weeds, and then a couple of days later, maybe it rained or you watered them, and a lot of weeds stand up that you thought were all terminated already. So with this hole, you have to be really careful that you get all the weeds, or you just need to pull it through the ground, really, so that everything gets scraped off. Um, Another use for these hoes is for your potatoes. That's right. For hilling your potatoes, because some plants actually like the dirt to be brought up and have to. Potatoes, if you let the sun get on them, the dirt is not deep enough when you bury them, they will actually turn green and then you can't eat them. Yeah. So after you plant this and you start to get little plants, you heal take the this dirt. and you'll heal it up, heal it up around the, around the plant. Okay. Here we have one more tool that can be really handy in your garden. This is a, just a normal rake. Um, when you're preparing your seed beds, you want very even, soft, fine soil because that will make it much easier for you to be able to cover the seeds and properly get them to sit in the ground and get the right moisture they need. So a rake like this can help you when you pull it across the surface to pick out any leftover weeds, any rocks, any debris that could be in the way of your cedar if you use that. And by using the rake, you're making this little bit of a surface that's just about perfect for seeding. So it's really handy to have that. You can also use it when you're like raking things up. And one of the actually best yeah, ways I've I'll found let you explain that one. to use the, the rake is actually upside down. That's right. It may look funny, but this gives you a much more even surface because sometimes it tends to go too deep when you have the tines down, right. but this way it'll just ride nice and smoothly and then you have a smooth surface to run your cedar on. Awesome. Maybe we want to grab the, uh, the no power tiller. So yeah. here we have an old no power tiller. This is actually from my grandmother and you can still buy these brand new. So they have like a rototiller on the front and then some tines on the back. Turn and it. then you can also flip it upside down and use it like those wire weeder hose. So you just flip it over and we have it without the, the handle extension on it right now just to make it easier. Good. So that can be really helpful to cultivate stuff as well. Okay. What should we show next? So let's take some of these guys here. So we're moving a little bit more on to the harvesting part of things. Now you won't use these kind of tools for everything, but you'll use them for things where you're taking the whole plant or if you just want to clean up certain areas. For example, if you're harvesting dill for seeds, you could use one of these and take the whole bush and then you tie it up and hang it up and let it dry. Just now, why would you do that, Timon, instead of just picking the seeds right away? Yes. So a lot of times the seed will be mature, but it will still be connected to the plant. And if you can take the whole plant, hang it up to dry, it will bring all these seeds to the final ripening stage. They can suck the last little bit of energy or juice out of the plant. And also what's really helpful is when it's hanging like this, you know, each seed has their home. They have their space where they're hanging. So in the process of drying them, all of them are apart from each other. And they're all evenly drying them. If you harvested them off and there was still a couple of green ones in there and they weren't quite dry yet, and you put them somewhere all together, they might not dry properly fast enough and they might start going bad on you. So having it hang like this 
will keep them all in their spot where they can dry, where the air can go through, and then when they're ripe and dried up, then you can go harvest them. Yes. Yes. Can you repeat the question? question? Yes. So the question was, will the seeds fall off if you just hang it up? Yes and no. A lot of times, some of the seed will start falling off after it dries up a bit. So a good practice is to put something under that will catch those seeds that are falling off. A lot of them will stay on there for quite a while, actually. So as you long won't... as they're not disturbed. That's right. So if they're sitting, hanging there quiet, and no one touches them, and they're just hanging there, a lot of them will stay on there. If they get disturbed, or there's lots of wind blowing by, and animals getting there and whatever, um, a lot of them could fall off. So it's, it can be a really helpful thing to just put a container underneath so when they start falling off and you see oh okay they're 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 just about ripe now so yeah and that's a that's a good question especially when talking about some things like dry beans yes i've grown a lot of dry beans mm -hmm. and especially soybeans tend to explode so <laughs> when the pod actually gets ripe as you're pulling the plant if you because with soybeans if you wait for the pod to be fully ripe while it's in the ground then there's almost, it's almost impossible to harvest the seeds because as soon as you touch the plant, they just all pop and pop, all yeah. go flying everywhere. So what I would do is right when they're just before finished, take something like this and you'll grab the plant, cut it off and then hang it up. But then you have to, like came on said, yeah. catch it because they will very much like to explode and then you will lose a lot of your seed that way. Another use for these is for grain. Mm -hmm. When you're doing grain, this is a really good tool. You can grab a bunch of grain, cut it off. Um, that's not talked about that much when we're talking about no buy, no sell or growing our own grain. That seems like something that is uh, almost crazy, but it's yeah. not as complicated and hard as you might think to right. grow a decent amount of grain. And we actually um, have two little plots that Mackenzie planted over there in, on the field with some oats and some wheat. And even for that, to plant grains, you can use the earthway seeder and it works really well. I actually so, used the, I believe it was the, the beet disc yeah. because it caught just more than one seed, one to mm -hmm. two seeds, and gave a decent a little bit of space and uh, planted perfectly, really nicely into the soil. And then another version of this is the Big Brother. Yeah. So these are called sickles, the little ones. And these guys... Watch out for the Big Brother. ...is called a sai. I'll just bring it out here for a second. Actually, let's maybe put it this way. Okay. I can hold it like this one. So this is a sai, and you can get all different sizes. Maybe you can grab the other one, too. Yeah, this is... His little brother. <laughs> so they are for different purposes. Right. So you can use a big blade like this. You wouldn't use this really for harvesting grain or hard stalks because it's such a long blade yes. and it's actually quite flexible. So when you're swinging it, your tip might just catch in the dirt and then you're stuck. So you want one that's not too long and too heavy and that's pretty sturdy so it can actually cut the dry grains that are pretty hard actually at times. So this is more for mowing. So actually for mowing your lawn and it can go <laughs> extremely quickly if you are proficient with a scythe. Right. And this would be more the size if you're cutting off something that is a little stronger. You could use one in between these sizes. Um, these have the blade cover on them so that nobody gets cut right yeah. now. That's the, the red tip on there. Right. But these instead of using the sickle and just getting a little bunch like that, you would go through a wide swath, maybe three, four feet wide at a time, and sweep it through and, and be able to cut quite a lot quite quickly. Right. One of the things that's really important when you use any of these cutting tools is that you want to sharpen them really well. If they're not sharp, you're working for nothing. But if you can sharpen them really well, they will cut in a swing, it will just be a joy to work with them. So there's different types of 
sharpening stones that you can use. This is a pretty natural one and it's fairly hard so it'll do fine sharpening for you. There are some that are a bit more rough and softer, bigger grain type of sand in it as well that can be used. And when you sharpen them, you wanna try to sharpen the whole length of the blade so that it's evenly sharpened. And every so often, they will also need a little bit of, um, what do you call it, hammering it to- Oh, honing. Honing, yes. Honing. So you also wanna hone it once in a while. But I think if you, if you get the sharpening pretty good and you don't hit any big rocks in the cutting process, that will get your ways. The honing and is when, let's say you hit something hard and you bend your blade, right, you then need you, to straighten it out again. That's right, yeah. So this is one of the sharpening tools you can use. There's um, other different ones that you can use as well and that can really help you out. I've actually used those quite a bit back at home in Austria. And one time when we first started farming, we didn't have a mower or hay bind for a tractor yet. So all of us boys, each one of us took one of them size and we went out and we, every morning, cut hay. And after a week we had like maybe an acre or two all together. Every morning we did a couple hours and then we dried it and we actually had a bunch of hay. So that was quite the experience. But um, yeah, it does take a little bit of practice and it does take some yeah, muscle and a lot of perseverance because this machine is actually working you, you get tired. <laughs> and that's why it's good to start our country experience early right. so that we can learn to use some of these, these tools and become self-sufficient on our, our own property. Right. And these will become handy if you had, let's say, some pets or something like that. Uh, like Timon has some sheep and I have yeah. some goats and they <laughs> take hay and you need to have some way to, to feed them in the winter. Right. Okay, put these guys away. And we have just one more item that we will show you. It's quite a large item, so I'm gonna set down my mic for a second. So this is something called the paper pot transplanter. Some of you may have heard of it before if you watch different videos online from the market gardeners or other growers. Um, it can be a really handy tool for different crops that you want to start inside early a little bit and then transplant them out in big quantities. So this year, we used this machine out here the first time on these fields, and we actually planted a bunch of onions by seed into the system paper pot trays. And then when they were big enough, we put the tray on here, and you open the paper chain. So the way how it works is the paper is in a chain formed back and forth all these little cells. So each cell has a little plant in them. And then you put the tray in here, you lift the plants and put this slide in here. And then you put the paper chain here. And then the way how this works is it has a little plow back here that you can adjust in the depth. And then the plants basically move one by one down here into that little furrow. With the, with the exact spacing that you yeah, select. Yeah, the paper has the paper. a spacing. So every 10 or 15 centimeters, there's a plant. And so it pulls down here, and then there's two little arms that will push dirt on to the sides of it. And then these two little wheels, they're pretty heavy, they'll push each side of the plant into the ground so it's planted. And so then as you're pulling it, if you walk on the end there, you hold it, you pull it backwards. That whole tray, there's some over 260 plants in there. It'll just pull them out and make a nice row for you. So if you prep the soil well and you pull it pretty straight, it'll make some really nice rows. If you look there out on the field in our tour, or if you go back, you can check it out again. Most of the lettuce that's planted out there has been done with this. All our onions that are growing out there has been done with this system. And some of the kale and cabbage 
we did some trials on that as well. And that really saves time. Because if you have to go transplant little plants that come out of the greenhouse and you're in a rush and the rain is coming, you've got to get it done, all of them have to grow. This can plant 260 plants in about two minutes. And if you did that by hand, you would be sitting there for a while on your knees trying to get them in the ground. So I wouldn't suggest this for a 20 by 20 foot garden because you won't even be able to turn around with it. But if you have a bigger plot and you want to grow some things a bit more big scale, that is mechanical. It doesn't take a tractor, it doesn't take gas, it doesn't take anything crazy. It just takes you pulling it straight. And that can really save you a lot of time. And, you know, we're busy people. We don't have time to spend 48 hours a day in the garden, right? Because there's only 24 in a day. So if we can save some time, I know one guy, he did um, a two-acre farm only, just big enough if you do it intensively. And he said it saved him 40 hours in one growing season, just planting time. It saved 40 hours for him. So he basically had a week off because he had that tool in his two-acre market garden farm. So if you consider growing a little bit more and a little bit bigger, that can really be a, a valuable tool to have as well. Now with this, this is, we kind of worked our way more expensive as we went. Right. So the Earthway is at the lower end. What price range are we looking at for something like that? I forget the exact number, but we're, we're definitely talking also somewhere in the 2000 plus dollar range. Plus this machine needs some other um, parts to it, right? You need the trays that are the right size. You need to buy the paper chains that you stretch in and put in there and fill with Which soil. The paper chains are actually relatively cheap. They're, they're actually about, cheap, yeah. They're about one cent per plant. So adding one cent to each plant still adds up, but if it saves you a lot of time planting them, that can actually be really effective. So yeah, having those trays and the paper chains is the minimum you need to operate the system. There is some seeding equipment that you can use to specifically seed those paper chain trays. Um, I thought that was going to go a little bit too far today, but that combined can also really save you time there. This would be much more effective for someone who's doing like a market garden. Right. Or want to do a little bit more than their, their personal, getting to the, the higher end scale. Yeah. Okay. So... So now, I think we still have a little bit of time left here. Do we have any questions? Oh, we have some questions, perfect. Yeah, we'll take your question just now, just give us a second. We'll start with the ones that we got in and then we'll take your question there. We have uh, lots of questions. Oh, good. Okay, for seeding. How do you know if your seed is treated? Um, that's a good question. So if you take your seeds and you look at them and if you take your fingers and rub on them and if there's nothing coming off of the seed, then there's a pretty good chance it's not treated. If you see any abnormal color to it or any type of powder on it, then you know it's treated. The best way to settle that question though is look at your seed package. If it says untreated seed, then it should be untreated. If it says treated seed, then it will specify what it's treated with, and then you will see that. But there's usually a color to it that's not normal, what that seed would normally look like. Most seeds are kind of a brown or light color that's pretty um, standard. There, there's not a huge variety in most of the seeds here. But if they're treated, you will see that it's, it's not a normal color. It's sometimes red, sometimes silver, gray, white, and they, they have that powder on them. When you take it on your fingers, you'll feel it. It'll come off a bit. Now, some things are treated with not chemicals, but can be with like a mycorrhizal fungi. That is true, On yeah. things like beans and peas, which is not bad. And that so. will be hard to tell. If they've been um, treated with that, it'll be pretty hard to tell, but it's not bad, so it actually will help your beans or your soybeans to grow better, so. The best is if you just know when you're buying your seed. Right, right. 
Okay, I've planted seeds and then pulled up my seedlings because I could not tell the difference between weeds and my plants. Is there a way to prevent this from happening? Practice. Yes. <laughs> so I kind of mentioned that earlier when we were talking about the seeding here, sorry. When you start your seeds, use growing media or soilless mixes for that because that's basically a mix of peat moss, some wood chips that are processed very fine. They will have a little bit of perlite in there, which is a volcano stone that has been processed to a manufactured stone. And it's similar to charcoal, so it can absorb water and nutrients and then give them up. So if you use something like this, it doesn't come with any weed seeds. Now, if you plant your seeds, then the only thing that can grow is what you planted. Now, in the garden, um, it can be a bit more challenging, but even there, for the beginning, if you are having a little bit of a hard time knowing what is what, you could put a little layer of this soil mix in your garden in a small spot, plant some of your seeds in there, and plant the rest in a normal soil, and then you will see what's supposed to come out, and then you can match these plants and find, okay, this should stay there and this should come out. Another, another good thing is, um there's one method of planting that's become popular, and that's square foot gardening, where you're mixing a lot of plants. Mm -hmm. That makes it really difficult, especially for people who aren't used to spotting something and knowing right away what that plant looks like. So keeping things in rows. If Will you help. see your weeds perfectly spaced in rows, then they're not weeds. <laughs> that's your plants. Yeah. How do I know if I'm buying GMO seeds? You're not. That's the, the end of the question. Right. Um, unless you are a certified contract grower with a big company like Bayer, uh, they bought out Monsanto, then there's no way you are getting your hands on GMO seed. That's right. Um, how do you know when seeds are ready to save? That's a good question. Maybe you want to answer that for us? Th that's a big question because every plant is different. Ends, yeah. That's why I would reference back to a resource like this. This is an extremely invaluable book. Mm -hmm. Everybody should have one of these books. It is really, really good. It covers almost everything. Um, when I was learning seed saving, I went to learn from an old seed grower who mm -hmm. has a company in Saskatchewan. I went there and uh, he took me through many of his different process. And he suggested this book to me. And it has been one of the best things that you can get. Because when we're talking about beans, it's quite easy. You let it dry on the plant. Uh, most beans aren't as complicated as the soybeans that explode. You just wait for the pods to dry, pick them, open them, and then it, there's your seeds. Things like cucumbers, uh, tomatoes, those you actually have to have a mature fruit so a tomato, as long as it's bright red, it's getting a little bit soft, most of the time the, the enough, seeds yeah. are good. You'll scoop the seeds out, put it in a glass of water, and actually let it sit there for three days. And it'll start to get a foam, the coating will come off, you rinse it in a strainer, and there you go. Uh, with cucumbers it's similar, except when you harvest your cucumber, you have to let it ripen on the plant as far as possible mm -hmm. until it's orange. It yeah. will turn orange because it's actually yellow a melon. And orange, it'll look like, what? And then you'll take that and you'll let that sit on your shelf till after Christmas. So once it comes New Year, they will store for up to six months like that, as right. long as they're fully ripe. Because a green cucumber is actually an unripe cucumber. Right. And then you'll take the seeds and you'll do the same process as tomatoes, but uh, it's a huge topic and getting a book like this is really good. We will do some videos later. Mm -hmm. We want to be doing on how to save your seeds. We may do that this fall when everything starts to become ripe. Right. Um, as far as uh, the next question, which is carrot seeds. How do I save carrot seeds? I think we'll just leave that with the book as well. It's right. in the book. You can watch that. I'll read that. Um, switching to tools. Is there a way to till up the soil other than using that little tiller off-grid? When you don't have power, how do you do it? Do you want to start? Yeah, you can get a horse and a plow behind it and then you go. <laughs> or you can get other hand tools. Um, there's a lot of options, but all of them will, will take a lot of your 
energy and maybe the help of other animals. That's probably the most effective, I guess. Yeah, there's, there's many more tools than we showed today. That is true, yeah. Um, there's broad things called broad forks. Mm -hmm. They can be three feet wide. You can use them to open the ground. A shovel, which is a yeah. lot of work. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, there's many ways, many ways to do that. One of the things that can help with that, so you're not doing as much, is doing the mulching. Keeps right. the ground a little bit softer. So when you work it, it's not as hard and compacted. Yeah, that's right. Okay, and is there a way to harvest fast? I'm not sure exactly what that means, but... Depending on the... Really depends on the crop, yeah. 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 Okay, is there any questions here on the floor that you want to shut out? Yes. So they were asking what brand yes. it is that has the different attachments uh, uh, You mean on this the one? Yes. This one is called Never Sink Farm. They're down in the States and they sell those and you can buy different kits including different um, wire and sharp blade hose and yeah it's called Never Sink Farm. There's some other brands now making a similar product, right. but NeverSync is kind of the, the big originator of that idea. Right. Is there any other questions? Yes. Uh, how do you know if it's uh, certified organic? Uh, the seed? Yes. How do you so, know if it's certified organic? Yeah, thank you. So how do you know if it's certified? Everyone who grows and sells certified organic products will label them because they get a better price for it. So if you buy seeds and the package says um, certified organic by so and so, then you know it's certified. If it doesn't say any of that, it's most likely not certified organic. However, sometimes seed producers will produce the same seed up to the certified organic standard and then sell some of it certified and some not certified because they just want to move the seed. But most of the time, if you buy non-organic, it's probably not organic, but um, it will say on the package for sure if it's certified organic, because that makes them, that gives them that extra money, so they, they will make sure it's, it's labeled that way. Uh, one thing I just want to mention about that is if you're growing for yourself, it is completely not necessary to have organic seed if it's right. untreated. Yes. Because there's no difference. Yeah. Uh, unless you're certified organic, which requires you to put certified organic seed in the ground, That's right. then it's uh, not anything you should be worried about. Sorry. Question over there. Go ahead. We do a lot of Yes, that's a good point. So. Um, the, it wasn't really a question, it was more like a suggestion, which is very good, thank you for that. So basically, he was talking about using plastic tarps to cover the ground and then make holes in them and plant your transplants in there. That can really help keeping your weeds down and also for plants that need a lot of heat, it'll actually help to bring that heat in there and keep the ground warm even overnight and then those plants will produce a lot better for you. And there's a lot of different types of mulching materials. A, a thick plastic tarp can really help, um, given that you can get the water to the plants, because if it covers it really tightly and you don't get any rain in there, they might struggle a bit with that. But if you have like a drip tape underneath or some way of watering it right into the holes there, then that can be really effective. You can also mulch it with other materials that come out of your garden, like grass clippings, wood chips, and those things. But plastic can be really handy to start with, yeah, for sure. And that was the method we did in the greenhouse as well. Right. And um, it may not always work for an end time scenario, though, if you can't get right. the plastic. Any other questions? We have a question? I was thinking maybe to save that question for the next time, unless you want to address it now. Uh, I think you... we are running short on time, so maybe we will ask. I saw uh, that one in the bucket, so I do know about it. Um, but maybe that's a good, it sparked a good thought. Does organic seeds make a difference on your plant nutrients? If you were to buy organic seeds and plant them, is that something better than 
another seed? Um, we kind of talked about it a little bit. Generally speaking, if seed is grown and untreated, it's as close as it could get probably to growing it certified organic. Now, if the plant that has produced the seed has been sprayed, you may have some um, leftover of that spray on the seed. But um, generally speaking, if you get raw seed, you're, you're off pretty well. I don't think there's a big nutritional value difference in the fruit that you get from that seed. Okay. That, that'll be majorly decided on your ground. How you treat the seed. How, you, right. how you're caring. So how you feed your soil is how your soil feeds your plants, and that makes the biggest difference in the nutritional value of the crop that you're going to harvest. So the seed has an importance, but when it comes to that, I think the biggest part is for you to, to feed that soil and let the soil feed your plants. That's, that's going to be the biggest, yeah. Uh, one last question and then we'll close. Is there any other question here? We're good. Okay. Okay, awesome. awesome. Well, thank you guys very much. Yeah, thank you thank for you. your close attention. With a prayer. Okay, let's close with prayer. Yes. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you again that we can come to you and we can learn some of these practical methods that we can be prepared for the time coming, that we can be able to have food and help others as well. We thank you for this. Guide us the rest of our day. In Jesus' name, amen. This presentation was filmed at our 2022 camp meeting on site in British Columbia. If you would like to join for the next camp meeting, visit our events page for details, events.amazingdiscoveries.org.